Well, good morning. Good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. And we want to sing victory in Jesus. How many of you know there is victory in Jesus? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning My Savior forever He sought me and He bought me With His redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is to Him He plunged me to victory Beneath the cleansing flood I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. And certainly we're standing on holy ground this morning. Would surely 
He's our source of strength. Not only can I not walk, we can't breathe, live, or exist without the Lord. Amen? Amen. That was, that was great. That was great. I want to welcome everybody this morning, everyone here, as well as those who are watching online. We're glad you could join us. Uh, and if you were new, and we have a way for you to fill out uh, a little Connect card with us online, uh, GSBC Connect dot info slash I'm new the links up on the screen uh, it gives you all the dots and dashes and all that kind of stuff um, so we're glad you're with us and uh, you can also use that form if you if you need to update any of your personal information or anything so the church knows how to contact you you can still use the I am new form for that as well uh, but we're glad you are joining us today um, I'd like to ask y'all to pray for Pastor Freddie this morning. He has uh, got some throat issues, and so we need to pray that the Lord would, uh, would heal him and bring him back to us soon. And uh, we're going to have a guest speaker this morning, and we will uh, see him in just a moment, but most of us already know who he is. But um, anyway, uh, again, like I said, I want to welcome everybody that's watching online. I'm glad everyone is here. A couple of things we got coming up uh, in the near future. Um, we've got a couple of uh, little trips and activities. Uh, we've got two separate activities coming up, one for middle school, one for high school. Um, if uh, you are in that age bracket and have not been participating in the youth, you have kids uh, that uh, are in that age bracket, we, we've got a lot of stuff going on. We'd love to have you. We also, of course, we meet uh, every Sunday night. We have a, our Sunday school class at the regular time, 930, but we meet every Sunday night. Uh, at six, we eat. That's always a good thing. How many of you like to eat? Yeah, we always we always eat good. We we you know what I think about it. We eat every single time we get together, don't we? You know, the Sunday school we have breakfast. We have yeah. I like to eat. You can tell probably. But anyway, um, if it, we'd love to have you participate uh, in in that. Uh, if if like I said, if you're in that age group, uh, any anywhere from middle school up. And we don't cut you off as soon as you graduate from high school. If you're still consider yourself a young person, uh, you're welcome to hang out with the youth. All right. Um, so Sunday nights at six are when we get together to do that. Like I said, we got a couple trips and activities coming up. Uh, if you would like to have some more information about those, we got a middle school camping trip coming up, and the high schoolers are going to be going to. Uh, a beach house. We're going to kind of do our activities. This We usually do a big winter trip this year. We're doing things a little bit more low-key, not going to big populated areas like we have done in the past. But um, again, I've sent out some uh, info to some of the parents I have on my contact list. Be sure that uh, you get with me if you want some more information about that. And uh, with that, like I said, we'll pray for Pastor Freddie this morning. We'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on the service. Dear God, we thank you for this day, Lord, for everything you've given us, Lord. We thank you for being our Savior. We pray that you would just uh, watch over Pastor Freddie this morning, Lord, that you would uh, heal his throat, Lord, and that you would um, just bring him back uh, and restore him to full, full strength, Lord. I pray that you'd be the rest of the service, Lord, be with 
Brother James, Lord, as he brings a message this morning, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, touch our hearts to help us to uh, keep our eyes on you, focus on you, and to leave here today glorifying you in all we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Then the king will speak to those on his right. He will say, My father has blessed you. Come and take what is yours. It is the kingdom prepared for you since the world was created. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you gave them to me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the people who have done what is right will answer him. Lord, they will ask, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in? When did we see you needing clothes and give them to you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, What I am about to tell you is true. Anything you did for one of the least important of these brothers of mine, you did for me. We want to worship the Lord at this time now in the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings. We 
trials and temptations is their trouble Take it, take it to the Lord somewhere in prayer. Now can, can we find a friend so fair? it to the Lord somewhere in prayer. Oh, what a blessing he is to me. Oh, what a blessing my dear Lord is to me. He comes to share every burden I bear. Oh, what a blessing he I am not Freddie Young. <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. I got more hair. <laughs> not much, but a little bit more. Oh, Pastor Freddie called me this morning about 5.30. I was still in bed. Uh, I, I was still asleep. And uh, he left a message on my, my, my Magic Jack phone. And when I got up, I heard the phone ring again. But usually when that Magic Jack phone calls, it's nothing but... Uh, uh, people, you know, telemarketers and all this stuff, it don't ring very often, but I should have known at that time in the morning it could be important, but when I got up and I listened to the message, I saw it was him that had been calling, and, and when I listened to the message, it was like, all right, Jack, okay, so I couldn't really understand what he was saying, so I immediately called him back, and he, he told me that I lost my voice, and I can't really speak, so I said, well, you kind of need to speak to preach the Word of God this morning, so he said, would you please fill my pulpit this morning? I was like, yes, sir, I'd be more than honored and welcome to it. And I want to let you know it is an honor and a privilege uh, to be here with you today, especially among so much family, so many people here. <laughs> that love me and my wife. Uh, yesterday, I was in Augusta, and I was at CT's church. <laughs> up there for a soul winning conference with Pastor David, uh, Dr. David Wood, which we're all familiar with. He's been here before. And I got the privilege of going over to Grace uh, uh, City. It's a, it's a place where men, it's a men, men's shelter, and spent some time there. So I drove home late last night. And 
I had thought about going to Rock Hill today and visiting another church that sponsors us because I got a certificate I get to give to them uh, that came from Myanmar from the pastors there thanking them for their support and I've got one for you guys too um, but the Lord said no you need to go home I'm like why and this morning I found out why so we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit you never know you never know uh, what his purpose is for speaking to you like that just be obedient just be obedient if I hadn't have done so I wouldn't be here today boy would I be disappointed I'd be really upset with myself so I want to bring you greetings from my wife Mary she's in Union South Carolina with her daddy she's still taking care of him she sends her love she wishes she could be here she was excited for me this morning she's probably watching right now on the internet and I want to welcome everybody who's here today. I want to welcome all those who are on the internet watching. There may even be some of my uh, pastors from Myanmar might be watching, maybe some friends from India. Uh, I love the internet. I love the technology we have because uh, the, it can go all around the world. You know, we used to wonder how everybody could see Jesus appearing at one time. Well, it's possible now. We're living in the last days. So I, I just want to greet you, send greetings from my, my wife, Mary, and ask you to pray for Pastor. Uh, I, I love this church. It's a, a soul-winning church. It's a mission church. And uh, he asked me to fill his pulpit, but I can't fill his pulpit. He's a great man of God. I love him. But I'm going to give it everything I got by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring you a word today, which I believe the Lord has given me to give to you. All right? So with all that said, let me pray real quick. I need it. I got butterflies and things going on, which I always do. All right, our Heavenly Father, I come before you, throne of grace and Father, uh, love and mercy. We need you. I need you. Father, I, I need your power. I need your Holy Ghost. Cleanse me, Father. Fill me with your spirit until my cup runneth over onto these people, Father. Speak a word to us. We came here this morning to hear a word from you. We need a word from you. Teach us and uh, just give us the ears to hear and the minds to understand and receive and the heart to receive the message and then as we leave this place to go into this world and be doers of your word not hearers only but father we love you. we invite your presence here fill this place with your presence fill this place with your holy spirit father let each and every person that's here feel your breath upon them be still and listen and know that you're god and we ask this in jesus name amen Today I'm going to be looking at three different primary texts and I titled the message as you can see up there is Where Is Your Face? It's, a, it's an encouraging message. It's a message of hope and it's a, a message of peace. And if we ever needed a message of hope, a, a message of encouragement, a message of peace, uh, these days that we are living in today, we need a message like that. I need a message like that. The people in this church need a message like that. The world is without hope, and they need to hear of the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So my primary purpose here today is to encourage you that when you leave this place, that you will not be discouraged. You will not live the defeated Christian life. That you will live in the, the hope of our salvation, the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do not serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Savior who is alive he is more than able to save. He is more than able to complete that salvation in us until that day and work on us and make us in the shape, image of his son, Jesus Christ. Until that day he appears and our salvation will be complete when we're transformed and we meet him in the air. I believe I'm going to meet him in the air. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm loving his appearing. I'm looking to that eastern sky for his appearing at any moment. And I can believe it could be before I finish this message. How can we be discouraged with such a hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ? But it happens. It happens. So the title of the message today is, Where is Your Faith? The record of this event, we know, is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, Luke and Mark. My mouth's dry. 
In the book of Matthew, this event in chapter 8 follows chapters 5, 6, and 7, which we're all familiar with. Uh, that's the Sermon on the Mount. And praise God, that Sermon on the Mount is going to be a reality in this world one day when Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his millennial reign on this earth. That's going to be how we live. That's, that's going to be a reality in our lives. And I'm looking forward to that day when that becomes a reality. But that's the Sermon on the Mount. We're all familiar with that. That's the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then chapter 8 begins with the record of Jesus cleansing a leopard who, who came to Jesus and worshipped him saying, Lord, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. I'm here to tell you today that the Lord is more than willing. He's more than able and he can make us clean. He can make us clean by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this leopard, he recognized, this leopard worshipped Jesus. You see it as you look at the scripture. As you look at the scripture in the beginning of, of chapter 8 in Matthew, I'm going to just touch on a couple of these things before I get to the main scripture. But the leper he worshiped jesus christ the leopard is a jew he he being a jew knew that god alone is is to be worthy of worship in church god alone through jesus christ is the only one who is worthy of all of our worship honor and praise we worship him today we honor him today we praise his holy name today the leper believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He, he called him by his title. He, he believed that he was the Son of God, the promised one of God, the Messiah. He was a Jew. The gospel came to the Jews first. But he believed, just as the priest, he also believed this, just as the priest and the Jews believed at that time, that his leprosy was a mark of displeasure from God. They believe because of the sins of the parent or because of the individual sins or, or some other sin, we know that it is ultimately because of the fall of man, because of sin that leprosy is in this world. But he believed that this leprosy had been given to him from God, just like the priest believed. So he also believed, though, that God, because he is God, he was the only one who could take this leprosy or cure this disease that he had. And I'm here to tell you today that we all have leprosy because leprosy is a picture of sin in the Holy Word of God. And we all have leprosy. We all have life, sin in our life. We all have sin which causes death, which leads to death. And the only cure for any of us is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ just as this leper did. And to be washed in his blood and have our sins forgiven by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this leopard, he also understood, he, he also knew that if I was going to be cured, and I'm here to tell you today, if anyone in this room is going to be cured or anyone on that internet is going to be cured of their sin problem, their sin disease, which is unto death, he, he knew that the only way I'm going to be cured is if I get myself to Jesus. If I have faith in Jesus. So he came immediately, the leprosy, he came and, he, and he, he, he sought Jesus out. And the leper believed in Jesus, and the object of his faith was in Jesus, who is God the Son. And we see that in, in Matthew 8, in, in verse 2, it says, the, uh, And behold, there came a leper uh, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the moment I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God made me a new creation in Him. I was washed in the blood and I was made clean. I am righteous because I'm clothed in the righteousness of God. I stand in my position as a child of God before the, the one true living God, righteous. Not that I am righteous, but I am righteous in the sight of God because of Jesus. Practically in this world, I'm a sinner just like you. But hallelujah, when I enter into that throne room of grace with prayer to the Lord Jesus, with, to God the Father, by the, through the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm clothed in his righteousness. And he looks at me, he doesn't see me, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus as a child of God. Then we move on. We see beginning in verse 5. We have the account of the centurion. Oh, this is one of my favorite stories. Because this is a Gentile. This is not a Jew. The centurion is a Gentile. He's, he's a Roman soldier. Yeah, and we see uh, the account of the centurion, a Roman, uh, a Gentile, outside of the Abrahamic covenant. The centurion, notice uh, what he says in the verse. As we look at verse 5. In verse 5, he says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. 
Did you hear it? Beseeching him. I wonder how many of us are beseeching him this morning. But this centurion came beseeching him, and, and look what it says in verse 6. I didn't want to go there, but I'm going to go there because the Holy Spirit is leading me to go there. And he's saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grieving, grievously tormented. I'm going to touch that in a minute. But this centurion, uh, he, he comes to Jesus asking with passion. We, we need to get a grip of this. We need to understand that because he comes asking with passion. He comes asking with urgency. He's got a servant that he loves that's dying. And he comes with this passion. He comes with this urgency because of the urgency of the moment. He, and he comes fervently. We need to understand that word. He comes fervently. He comes passionately. He comes with urgency. He comes passionately, uh, fervently. And he's imploring. He's beseeching the Lord Jesus to heal his servant. He loved his servant. Does any of us have loved ones in our family? Who need a touch from the Lord? Are we beseeching Jesus, interceding on their behalf with this kind of urgency, this kind of passion, this kind of fervency, imploring with the Lord Jesus Christ to touch them, to heal them? How about the lost souls? We all have lost souls in our family. Are we coming before the Lord in this kind of fashion and praying for our lost loved ones? With this kind of faith? I hear you. The only one that said amen. The little puppy on the front row. Even the rocks would cry out. Even the little puppy would say, yeah, amen. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. If we love our family, if we love our friends, if we love the lost... As much as Jesus, or as much as the centurion does right here, we will come in that way before the throne room of grace, before God Almighty, and pray that way. We know what it says in James 5. It's the fervent prayers of a righteous man that availeth much. Praise God, my mother prayed for me that way. Y'all know my testimony. I was a prodigal for 20-something years, but my mama and her Sunday school class never gave up praying for me. And I know they prayed that way. But we see the centurion, he tells Jesus of the servant's condition. Do we go before God? Do we tell him about the condition of our loved ones? Do we tell him about their lostness? Do we tell him about the things that, that we know that they need a touch from God? And look what the servant condition of the servant. He says, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And I'm telling you, anyone who's living in sin apart from the Lord Jesus Christ has never put their hope or belief in him. They might not know it, but they're grievously living in torment. Torment. They might not know it. One day they will. And this centurion, he loved his servant. God help us to love like that. I know when I'm in trouble in the mission field, when I lose my ability to weep for the lost. Have we lost our ability to weep for our lost? To weep for those who are sick? To weep for our nation? I'm telling you, if we don't pray like this, I'm not so sure we're going to come out of this. God's our only hope. Jesus is our only hope. In other words, the servant is, he's in the bed of affliction. Has anybody here ever been in the bed of affliction? <laughs> Does anyone here know someone who's in the bed of affliction? <laughs> we all do. We all do. He's in a miserable, afflicted condition. And then in verse 7, Jesus says to the centurion, I will come and I will heal him. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Well, thank God for all those I will statements in the Bible where Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I mean, 
Thank God for all those I will statements. And here, I can see the centurion when he said it. And God will say this to you if you will pray for your loved ones in this same kind of way. He will say, I will come to them and I will heal them. If you're in the bed of affliction, if you will beseech Jesus in the same way, he will tell you the same thing because you're a child of God. I will come to you and I will heal you. It might not be the way you want it to be, but I guarantee you, you're going to get a healing. Praise God for the ultimate healing. No more sin. Woohoo! That ought to make you shout. No more pain, no more suffering, no more arthritis. In the presence of Jesus. Forever. I don't know how, how long is forever, Cleve? Forever and ever. Hallelujah. I better move on or I ain't never going to get to it. But the centurion in him, humility, he acknowledges his unworthiness. Oh, don't miss that. He acknowledges his unworthiness to have the Lord come under his roof. The centurion is a man of human authority. He understands authority. I was in the military. Many of you were in the military. We understand authority. But in the centurion, he understood authority. He knows how things work with people who have authority. And he understood the power of that authority. He understood the power of God in Jesus. Sometimes I wonder if we do. He recognizes the power, the authority of Jesus, the authority he has. And we know what the scripture says in Matthew 28. All authority has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. He understands and trusts in the authority of Jesus, having faith in the power of the spoken word of God. Lord, you just speak the word and I know it'll happen. God, that we would have faith like that. Where's our faith? Notice in verse 10, the response of Jesus after hearing what the centurion said. He expresses his faith in the authority of the word of Jesus. And in verse 10, Jesus marveled. Wow. He marveled. He marveled at his faith. Wow, I wish I could have faith that would marvel Jesus. Huh? Give me that kind of faith. I want that kind of, you know, faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we can pray to increase our faith. But you've got to let it be tested. Adrian Rogers said, a faith not tested can't be trusted. But your faith ain't going to be tested unless you step out in faith. Without faith, we know the scripture says. We know what it says. Jesus marveled. He admired the faith. And, and he also honored his faith. For in 1 Samuel 2.30, it says, God honors those who honor him. Do you honor him? We know God honors those who honor him, and we know that God is pleased with faith because the scripture also says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. We can't even please God without faith. If you want to please God, you better have faith. We know, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. And listen to what else it says. Listen, for he that cometh to God, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Don't come up here without belief. Don't come up here with your prayer without faith. Listen. The verse continues to say, and that he is a rewarder. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and I can pray earnestly and fervently with passion because uh, I'm clothed in the righteousness of, of Jesus Christ himself. And I know when I pray to God and he hears my prayer, he's going to reward my prayer. Might not be the way I want it. But I can always trust he's going to do what's best. He's going to do what's right. Listen, he's not, that's not the end of the verse, is it? Because it says, also, who are these people he rewards? Them that diligently seek him. Diligently, not just ho-hum. 
diligently. Words, words are important. We need to listen to these words. We need to live these words. With diligence. Diligently. And especially when it comes to spiritual warfare matters. When you're in that bed of affliction and Satan's buffeting you like we're going to look here in a minute. We need to diligently seek him, earnestly seek him, seek him with effort. Uh, maybe we, even with difficulty. You ever find it hard to pray? Sometimes I get up cleave and I just say, Lord, I don't know how to pray, but please help me. You ever been in those kind of situations? Lord, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to ask for, but you do. Holy Spirit, Jesus, intercede on my behalf. Pray with moanings and groanings. You, you know my heart. I might not be able to express it. I might not be able to get the words in my mind. I might not be able to get them across my lips. But I, I, he can intercede for me. And, and the Holy Spirit can moan and groan with the God. And with, the, with the passion that's inside of me. And God hears my prayers. Yes, Jesus was marveled. And look what he said. He said in that same verse. He says, Barely I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. Not in all of Israel. Wow. I wonder if that centurion was in this room today. If Jesus might say, I have not found such a faith in Grand Strand Baptist Church. God forbid. Or any church. Or any believer. May God come to you and he find that kind of faith. Faith like that centurion. May he come to me and find that kind of faith. I wonder, like I just asked, if Jesus were to show up today, will, if he is here, because we know he's inside of each and every one of us, and I believe that the, the, whole, the angels are, are watching, we can't see the spiritual realm, but it's here, and I believe Jesus is walking up and down that aisle just looking for someone who will pray to him in this way so he can reach out and touch them. He's here. If he were here, here today, would come here today, would he find faith? Would Jesus marvel at our faith, or would he find unbelief? The sin unto death. Unbelief. The unpardonable sin. The one unpardonable sin. Unbelief. Would he find unbelief? A dead church with Ichabod on the door, meaning the glory of the Lord has departed. Would he find that here? No, he wouldn't find that here. But I've been in some churches where that's true. Y'all have heard me say it before. I visited, well, I'm not going to give the name of the church, but, but I almost slipped up. Uh, I visited a church one time when I walked in with my wife. It was so dark and dreary. And I looked at my wife. I said, it's stinketh in here. So dead. God forbid he should ever visit a church and, and find a church of unbelief. Or, or maybe will he find a church with little faith? He said that to the disciples all the time, and sometimes I fit that description as well. It seems like I have little faith. Why do we have such little faith? Why are you unbelieving? It's a doubting church with relatively no power to do nothing for church, nothing for Jesus. God forbid that we should be people of little faith. Or will he find great faith? A church on fire for God, fully persuaded and convinced that the Word of God, the Holy Word, the Bible, is Holy Spirit inspired, God breathed, inerrant, infallible, unchanging, and established and in heaven. Jesus said, not one jot, not one tittle will ever, ever disappear, banish, whatever you want to call it. A church where Jesus is not only Savior, but He's Savior and Lord. Everybody loves the Savior. That Lord part that they have a lot of difficulty with. The church that Jesus would find here is, is totally up to us. The people in this room, the member of the body of this church, 
The kind of church that Jesus would find if he was to stand right before us here today is totally up to us. God, help us have faith. Increase my faith. The measure of faith, it will be manifested in many different ways, but if we have faith in Jesus Christ, it, you can look at people and, and look at their, their surrender to His will. That's a, a manifestation. That's a evidence of the faith that they have. The surrender to His will and His Lordship. Our love for God is another manifestation. Our love for one another. Do we love one another? That's another manifestation. And for our love for the lost and the lost, our love for others. Another manifestation. Our service to God and works. How are you doing in those areas? How am I doing in those areas? Faith, we know the scripture says, faith without works is dead. James 2, 6, for the, for the body without the spirit is dead. We all know that. I've been to many funerals, touched many bodies. Without the Spirit, that body is useless, it's worthless, it's going back to the dust of the earth, it's dead. So, for the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We're not saved by works, we're saved by faith, by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But that faith should produce good works. A faith that is genuine, a faith that is, has, has the love of Jesus Christ inside of them will have love for others and it will produce good works. I do good works because I love the Lord and I, I am so thankful for all that He's done for me not to earn my salvation. But it's my only reasonable service, as it says in Romans 12, that it's the only thing I can offer back to Him is myself to live for Him, to do His works. That was just the introduction. I'm just kidding. Now we're going to look at the story I really wanted to get to today, but it was necessary to look at all these things before we get there. In, in Matthew 23 through 27. It won't take long. We're all familiar with this story, but see, we are in a storm. The disciples find themselves in a storm. If you don't think we're in a storm, I don't know where you've been under a rock or something or another, but we're in a storm. And it's a raging storm. We've been in storms before. But this one, I know my God's able. I'm not concerned about myself. I'm concerned about everybody else. We're in a storm. It has been said, and everybody's familiar with this, every man is either going into a storm or, or going through a storm or coming out of a storm, but Jesus is always with us. The storm is out there. If you're not in a storm, trust me, it's coming. It's coming. The bed of affliction is coming. The storm is coming. We're in a storm right now. So let us look at the text. Uh, we know that this is taking place. Uh, all these things that I've been speaking about took place before this. And, and Jesus has preached the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus' disciples, they have come down from the mountain. And they are coming down to the valley, the Sea of Galilee, which is some 650 feet below sea level. Pastor has talked about that area much. I don't have to go there and explain all that. But storms rise in, in that area very quickly and very severely at times. All right. So uh, as they were coming down, the disciples witnessed Jesus perform the many miracles we talked about. Anyone here today seen Jesus work a miracle? I have. The greatest one was in me. I'm serious. The greatest one was in me. I pray you've seen that same miracle. Jesus heals the leper. We saw that of his leprosy. Jesus healed the centurion's servant by just speaking. Jesus healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law, which we didn't touch on, but just with his touch. Just with his touch. 
And that same evening, we didn't touch it in the scripture, but they brought to Jesus many people. You read the scripture for yourself. And some of them were even demon-possessed, and he healed all the sick. He had compassion on everyone that came. He first met their physical needs, and then he met their spiritual needs. That's a lesson for us to learn. Well, let me chase a rabbit here. I want to, but I'm not going to. We see it. We saw it in verse 16. If we'd have read it, we've seen it. So, then Mark and, and Luke's account, Jesus says to his disciples, you won't see it in Matthew, but this is what he said to the disciples, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. Wow. That kind of makes you want, but think about ourselves, too. We're the same way. They shouldn't have been fearful at all, should they, Brother Eddie? Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake. <laughs> when Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side of the lake, they should have had faith enough to know that it didn't matter what kind of storm come up against them, they were going to get to the other side. And you're going to get to the other side. Jesus has said so. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And he's coming back. Jesus entered into the boat. Are you in the boat? Are you in the boat? No, wait a minute. Are you in the boat? Jesus entered into the boat. I want to be in that boat with Jesus. I don't want to be in just any other boat, any kind of boat. I want to be in that boat with Jesus. But Jesus entered into the boat, more than likely a fishing vessel. We're pretty sure it probably was a fishing vessel. Uh, and, and one of the disciples that knew very well, they were fishermen. They knew fishing vessels. They knew the Sea of Galilee. They were familiar with all these things. Uh, it was a fishing vessel, one they knew very well. And the weather must have been good because, like I said, they were fishermen. They wouldn't have got in a boat where there was a raging storm going on. So the weather must have been good. It may even have been great. It might have been a beautiful day the sun shining the birds singing and everything was wonderful and they got into the boat and Jesus got into the boat with them because they they would have not have gone into the boat if they knew a storm was coming well we don't know when our storm's going to come but we need to be in the boat with Jesus and Jesus in the boat with us for when that storm does come he will be with us they were fishermen you know the weather had to be good Everything might be good in your life today, but trust me, a storm's coming. Because it was Peter and Andrew, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in the boat. They were fishermen. They knew. They knew. The sons of thunder. These disciples of Jesus Christ who, who walked and lived with him saw the miracle signs and wonders. They would have not gotten into the boat to cross the sea if the skies were threatening. Think about that for a minute. The skies are threatening. I wonder how many people want to get in the boat. All right? and, and there was any indication or possibility of an impending violent storm, they wouldn't get in the boat. And the scripture says in verse 24, there arose. Well, you know what? One day in your life, it's going to be, there arose suddenly, unexpectedly, a storm's going to arise. And suddenly, out of nowhere, how many of you know that storms sometime come upon us suddenly, without warning, and the storm was a great tempest. Woo! Thank God I had many of those. But they have happened. Storms can be extraordinarily powerful, cause great damage, pain, and suffering. You might even think you're not going to come out of it, or you might not survive. I know Brother Freddie's been there with his cancer and other things. Many of you probably been there. But God was with you. Storms can be extremely or extraordinarily power, cause great damage, pain, suffering, or to the point that you might not think you'll survive. And the scripture says that the ship was covered with waves. Covered! Sometimes you might feel like you're covered with waves. When your storm comes, there be, we're being, uh, they were being violently tossed to and fro, <laughs> upon the sea and we're about to go under i felt that way before i felt like i was beginning to sink or or succumb to the power of the winds and the sea the storm that i was in i can understand how these disciples felt but jesus he was asleep i wonder why 
He's God for one thing. And he knew what the Lord, uh, his father, had sent him on the mission. He hadn't accomplished that mission yet, so he had more faith <laughs> than the disciples did when Jesus said, let's go to the other side. He, know what he, he, never mind. he knew he was going to accomplish his mission. Now, we know Jesus could have prevented the storm. He knew there would be a storm, but he allowed the storm to come for his purpose and that he might be glorified. So when a storm comes in our lives, we have to remember that God has a purpose for everything in our life. Whether it's produced perseverance, whatever the case might be, but he has a reason for those storms. They come. And first and foremost, to glorify him. Let me, let me ask you a question, to be honest. Well, you don't have to say anything, but just in your own heart. When the bed of affliction comes, when a storm comes, when do you pray the most? When do you, when do you spend the most time with the Lord? Hmm. He sends these storms to manifest his authority. His lordship and his deity. Jesus is God. Verse 25, the disciples became so frightened. We do the same thing. We get frightened. We get scared. We become so frightened. And they wake Jesus up. Who is at peace, <laughs> resting in the Father. That's the key. In the Father. Trusting in the Father's will. They wake up Jesus saying, Lord, save us, we perish. I hope if there's anybody in this room today or anybody on the internet watching, that if they have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will cry out, Lord, save me, for I perish. If you don't think you're going to perish, you need to read John 3.16. Don't read some of these translations that say that you might not die. No, you might not perish. It's an awful word. 26, notice what Jesus says, verse 26, how he responds to their fear in the storm, and he, he speaks these words to us today. Why are you fearful? If it had been me, I'd have been like, why are you, what are you guys doing? Why are you so fearful? Did I not say we're going to the other side? We do the same thing. Has God not said he's more than able to complete that good work that he has begun in you? Is he not able to provide for all of our needs just as he has said? Why are you fearful, O ye of little Had not Jesus said to them, let us pass over to the other side? Mark 4, 35, Jesus is in the boat. He is with them. You know Jesus is with us as well. When we are in a storm, He is with His church. I don't care what the government does. He's with His church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's not only for defense, that's for offense. You know, we had the power and the authority in the Lord Jesus Christ to snatch souls out of hell by being soul winners and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. He's able to save from the uttermost to the guttermost. He saved me. Amen. I hear you, brother. Hallelujah. Mark, he says, Jesus, it says Jesus is in the boat. He's with them. You know Jesus is with his church, and he's with the church in the storm. We have no reason to fear. Sometimes for us, though, we're just like the church. We're just like those disciples. We're so fearful. It may seem to us Jesus is unaware of our circumstances. He knows everything. He's aware of everything. As a matter of fact, those fools up there don't even understand that he's orchestrating everything. Do you really believe that they, do you really believe they are smart enough to come up with all these schemes and do all these different things that they're doing against, against the God, rebellion against God? Do you think they're really that smart no they're being led by the father of lies the, the accuser of the brethren satan himself 
I don't fear them. Bring the storm. I've already dreamed I'm going to jail anyway for hate speech, so. <laughs> I can't preach at some churches because of that. That's sad. All you got to do is mention, mention, mention sexual immorality, homosexuality, or abortion, and a lot of churches won't let you back in the pulpit. You start preaching sin and blood and, and, and repentance and stuff like that, some pulpits won't let you back in there. That's right. Shout it anyway. Amen. I got to hurry up. When you don't get opportunity to get up here much, you want to take full advantage of every moment you got. You, know, you understand? You hear what I'm saying? Jesus is aware of our circumstances. It may seem to us that Jesus is asleep. He never sleeps or slumbers. Never. Even when he was asleep, he knew what was going on. He knew what was going on before it even happened. It was a test. It was a teaching moment. It was a moment for him to be glorified and to reveal himself and who he is. He's God. Sometimes it might seem like he doesn't have a concern for us, but he cares for us. He cares for each and every one of us. He's our shepherd. The good shepherd loves his sheep. He loves us. In Mark 4, 38, the disciples said unto Jesus, Master, can you hear him? We do the same thing. We do this. Don't look at me and tell me you don't, because I've done it myself. Master, carest thou not that we perish? You're asking Jesus, he cares is not that you perish? Are you kidding me? He saved your soul, didn't he? Now, that's, pretty, that's a lot of care. He forgave your sins. That's a lot of care. And I still continue to rebel against him at times and sin against him. But if I confess my sin, repent of my sin, turn from my sin, he still cares and he restores my righteousness. He cleanses me and restores my righteousness. And he's built me a mansion. And one day he's coming back for me. And you too, if you're in the boat. The question is, are you in the boat? So wow, <laughs> you know, if we be honest, we, we, we say we, we said the same things before. So Jesus says to us, why are you fearful? Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You know what that verse says to me? We have a choice to make. We can decide whether we're going to let our hearts be troubled or not. And the way to not let your heart be troubled is to give it to Jesus. Yes. Believe, have faith in God. And his son, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost. We leave him out too often. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? You believe in God, right? Yes. yes. You believe in God, right? Yes. Believe in me also. You believe in Jesus, right? Yes. Oh! Why is your heart troubled? Help me, Lord. Let not your heart be troubled. Make the choice to believe in Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on Him. Live for Him. Live in Him. And allow Him to live in you and have control and reign of your life. Allow Him not only to be your Savior, but be your Lord. And your heart will not be troubled. Has Jesus not said, listen, lo, I am with you always even until the end of the age or the world? Huh? Has he not said that? Does not God's holy word tell us, they say, fear not some 365 times. I like that. I like that number because there's 365 days in a year, so that's one for each day of the world because we fear every day. 
Has not God said in Isaiah 41, 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. And has he not also said, Psalm 55, 22, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. <laughs> Is not our God Jehovah Rapha, <laughs> the Lord who heals you? Is not our God Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides? Is not He Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace? Is He not Jehovah Rao? He is our shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is God, is our Abba Father. He's El Shaddai, Shaddai Lord God Almighty. El Elyon, the Most High God. He's Adonai, Lord and Master. That's my God. Jesus is Lord of all. Even the storm. Then Jesus arose. <laughs> he arose. Hallelujah. He arose. God, Easter's coming up. He arose. He arose in that boat and he rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great call. Have you let him arise, arose, however you want to say it, in your heart today? That you might have that peace, a great calm? Will you allow him to say, peace, be still in your heart, in your life, that you might know that calm? Have faith. Trust in God. These are difficult times, and I'm afraid, I don't want to be Betty Downer or whatever you want to call her, but I'm afraid that it's going to get worse, and if you believe the Word of God, it's going to get worse. And the only way we're going to get through this is if we do what God's Word says. If we have faith, pray, God, do not find us with no faith, unbelieving. Do not find us with little faith. God, help us have great faith. He arose, and there was a great calm. We saw that in Matthew 8, 26. So in Mark's account of the event, the Scripture says, Peace be still. Wow. Anybody need any peace? Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Jesus can bring calm to any situation, any circumstance, any storm that may arise in our life. Have faith. See, the way to have our fears silenced is to have faith, to bring our fear to Jesus, to pray the power, to pray in faith. James 5, 1, 5, we already talked about. Laying our fears before him. With that same kind of sincerity and faith and fervency, fall upon him. For he is our master. He is our Lord. And we can be sure that Jesus will not let us perish. He's given us his Holy Ghost. We've been sealed by the Holy Ghost. Yes. The earnest, a down payment on our salvation. It's good being a Christian. It's the best way to live. It's the best life. Amen. We should be the joyous, most happiest people on the face of this earth, even in the storms. I love that word, earnest, because it's only a down payment, Brother Eddie. If it's so wonderful here, oh, can you imagine what it's going to be in heaven? And I'm looking forward to that day. In my heart's desire, you are too. But if you're not a believer, it's not for you. So as we get ready to close, I'm going to turn over to Romans.
especially if there's anyone here who's never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would listen to the Word of God and hear the promise of God. Because in Romans 6, 23, well, 3, 23 and 6, 23, it tells us that all we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And then it says what we deserve for our sin or wages for our sin is death, eternal separation from Him to suffer that to perish, to suffer the wrath of God. Uh, and, but, but there is a way of escape. He loves us so much that he sent his father. He, the father sent his son so that we might have a way of escape. God sends nobody to hell. Don't believe that lie Satan tells you. He's made a way of escape. If you go to hell, it's because you chose to go to hell. Especially if you're listening to the message today. I, began, I, I used to tell the homeless people all the time, there's good news that I just shared the gospel here, but there's also bad news because right now you're in the valley of decision and you have to make a decision whether you're going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and if the Holy Spirit is wooing you and drawing you to himself and you should today is the day of your salvation do not deny the Lord Jesus Christ do not remain in your unbelief but believe in the Lord Jesus Christ have faith in him and by God's grace through faith in Jesus you shall be saved I'm pleading for your soul if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray everyone in this room is praying that fervently right now inside of themselves. Praying if there's any lost soul out there who has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That today will be the day of their salvation. And I wish I was with you so I could show you in the scriptures. But you're just going to have to trust me with what I say. Because I love to show the scriptures whenever I tell somebody what the word of God says. But in the word of God it says, if you, will, if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Believe. Have faith. What does it say? Verse 9, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Rescue. For the scripture says in verse 11, whosoever, I love that word, whosoever, because it's inclusive for everybody. In Asia, I have to always fight that lie that that gospel you're bringing over here, that Jesus you're bringing over here, it's not the Jesus for us. We, we have our own gods. It's the white man's Jesus. It's the God of Israel. It's the Christian God. That's not for us. We're Hindus. We're Buddhists. We're animists. We're whatever that case might be. That's your God. We have our own gods. But that's not what the Word of God says. He says, for whosoever. Amen. And if you're watching today and you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a whosoever. If you're in this room, you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a whosoever. Praise God, I'm a whosoever. Amen. And that's what the word says. It says right there, verse 11. Uh, let me find it again. I should have brought my glasses for the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him, what does it say? You believe on Him, shall not be put ashamed. You will be saved. For the Scripture says up there earlier, in verse 9, it says, 10, 9, it says that if you confess, repent, Turn from your sin. Confess with our mouth. You have to make it public. You have to let someone know. Cry out to Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning Lord, Messiah, Master, Jesus, meaning Savior. And we know in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Pastor, that's mighty narrow. Well, I'm sorry, take it up with God. He's the one that made the way. He's God. He has that right. He has that authority. And he has said, you will not enter in heaven unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He told Nicodemus that. So I plead with you today. Because he says, if you will confess with your mouth, just call out to him. Ask him to forgive you of his sins. Uh, believe. And it says, it says, believe in thine heart. Believe, believe in thine heart. I pray the Holy Spirit of God is working in your heart right now testifying to you that what you've heard today is truth and that God loves you and He wants to save your soul. He does not want you to perish. Believe in your heart. Cry out to Jesus. And if you will believe in heart that God has raised Him dead, that is the evidence. That's the manifestation of His deity. Jesus is God. He is the only way. That God the Father raised Him from the dead. Then you have the promise here. Thou shalt be saved. Praise God for that promise. 
And that promise is for you too. Won't you come to Jesus? He loves you. He wants to save you. Please, somebody want to come up here and Barbara, pray a little, play a little song. I don't know if there's anyone here lost today, but it, that invitation is for you if you are. We got many burdens. I got burdens on my heart. But as Pastor Freddie says, if you're here today and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've been saved, raise your hand as a public confession that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to covenant with me today. I want you to, 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 to make a commitment to God. I will not fear. I will not fear. For I know who you are. I know who I have put my trust in. And you are more than able. No matter what storm comes, no matter what circumstance I'm in, no matter what the situation is, you are more than able to save my soul, to deliver me from that situation, to bring healing, whatever the case might be. But if you're not here today and you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, those promises aren't for you. And it's my prayer that today will be the day of your salvation. So pray with me, church. Pray with me, church. And I want to give the give an invitation. Jesus gives the invitation that if you will come forward and, and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you shall be saved. So if there's anyone in this room within the sound of my voice, even if you're on the internet, send us a, a text message. Send us any kind of message you can uh, and let us know that you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you, you want to say a simple little prayer like this because, because uh, you might not know what to say. You might not have the words. You, you might not be able to say the words. You can say something as simple as this, and the prayer doesn't save you. It's that faith, that confession with the mouth, the believing in the Lord Jesus Christ that saves you. But you can cry out to Jesus and say something like this, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I turn from my sin. I ask for your forgiveness. And from what I've heard today, according to your word, that if I ask for forgiveness, you are faithful. <laughs> you have promised to forgive my sins. So I'm trusting you for that forgiveness, Jesus. And according to your word, when I trust in you, when I have faith in you, when I put all my faith in you, for that forgiveness and for eternal life, I now have it. So I want to thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving my soul. Help me from this day forward to live for you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but it might be somebody here or somebody on the internet that said that prayer. But according to God's word, it says, Thou shalt be saved. But you need to let somebody know. Let somebody know. We want to help you. We want you to be part of our family. We, we want to, it's not easy being a Christian sometimes, especially if you're out there alone. It's not, you're not meant to be alone. God has a big family. And he wants you to be, you are part of that family. He wants you to have fellowship with that, with that family. We need each other. We pray with each other. We encourage each other. You need to become part of this, this uh, family or, or you might be out of state in some other area. Find you a good Bible-believing church where Jesus is and where He's glorified. And go join up in them, with them. And, and enjoy this new life that you have. Read Romans 6 when we're talking about baptism. And go walk. Be baptized. That's the next thing. And go walk in that newness of life that you have now. It's a glorious life. It's a wonderful life. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory. You want to close this? I go ahead. Okay. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. I want to thank you for being here today.
Thank you for being patient. Might have gone a little bit long. But uh, I had a wonderful time. Bless you. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and love and mercy, Father. Under the blood of Jesus. Father, we love you. We love the church. It's your church. It's not our church. It's your church. We're one big family. Help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Help us to love one another, the evidence of our salvation, so that others might see the love we have for one another and, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to weep and cry. Help us to weep and, and plead for the souls of the lost. And help us to even pray for our enemies. That's the only hope they got. And we, there are many. So, Father, mold us and shape us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. Fill us with thy Holy Spirit, which is the power to do, the power to live the Christian life. And as we go out into the highways and byways, let us invite others to come to the feast, others to come and sit at the feet of the Master and be taught by him and to have that salvation that he has promised by God's grace through faith in him so that they might be part of our big family, the family of God. Help us to be faithful, for you are faithful. Help us to remember to be holy, for you are holy, and you've called us to holiness. And help us to let our light shine wherever we might go, that others might see Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen.